Okay, so another important topic in digital geometry processing is mesh parameterization and today I will talk about that. So this problem is about mapping from one domain to another. In particular we will see an input surface mesh in 3D and we want to map it to another domain, uh, mostly in 2D for instance for texture mapping. Uh, so we want to find a bijective one-to-one -one mapping from this 3D domain to another domain, let's say 2D, as in this case. We will also see uh, parameterization to spherical domain as well, which is in 3D. Um, so let's talk, think about 2D parameterization, uh, so parameterizing to a 2D domain. Uh, so the main application is the texture mapping, a famous one in computer graphics. Uh, so once I map this 3D surface onto 2D, where my JPEG or BMP images live, uh, so I can just overlay that uh, flattened mesh with that image and get the colors from that. This is what we call texture mapping actually. So it is made available with the mesh parameterization we will learn today. Mm, so this is 2D parameterization and here is another one, spherical parameterization. Given the surface mesh, arbitrary mesh in 3D, I map it to a unit sphere. This will be also useful in applications like shape correspondence or morphing. So let's take shape correspondence. So you have two shapes to be uh, matched vertex by vertex. It is not trivial to do it on the original domain, but if I can map them up to sphere and give some landmark manual correspondences and align these spheres with respect to those corresponding points, then I get the perfect mapping. And you can use that mapping to morph, actually, so because of morphing is basically, so where is my pen here? Uh, morphing is basically this action, right? I want to morph from this shape to this shape, maybe. Which is not so logical, but anyway. So you need to find correspondence. So this point corresponds to this point. This point maps to this point, etc. Then you put a primitive, like a line, between the corresponding points. And you go 0.5 amount on, the, on all the lines connecting the corresponding points and if you do it for all the points then you get your intermediate shape right this is the idea so correspondence is a crucial information I can, and I can get that with this uh, spherical parameterization uh, which then enables morphing or shape interpolation as we have just seen uh, so this is from 3d to 2d uh, yeah uh, we will see the idea of this clearly in a second but other than texture mapping in 2D I can also have this is not texture mapping but uh, the idea is so once you have this flattened uh, surface then I can overlay it with an image right then I have this texture mapping application but I can also have another application called remeshing so for simulations or other purposes, good meshes, like meshes with uniform triangles, equilateral triangles are preferable. So here is one input mesh which doesn't have that many good triangles. It is anisotropic, so not uniform in all directions. So what I can do is, I can map it to 2D, okay, then I disc discard all the connectivity. So I have the point set from here here then I can apply a theoretically sounds uh, triangulation in 2d so on on this lower dimension I have better options like the Lanai triangulation so I do it here uh, and then I lift the points back to 3d because remember these points so this is the maybe vertex let's go from here this is maybe vertex 72 this is vertex 72, this is vertex 72, and this is still vertex 72, so I know the 3D point of the 3D coordinate of this vertex 72, so I can lift it up there. And when doing that lifting, I will use this connectivity, 
right? This gives me a better remeshing. Uh, what else? We are talking about the same thing here. <clears throat> yeah, so we are pulling back triangulation information for the remeshing. And here is another way to see it the remeshing. Uh, and uh, mapping it to 2D is not sufficient. Uh, it is sufficient, but uh, depending on your mapping quality, your output in 3D, when you lift stuff back to 3D, the output may not be that good. So we should be good at the uh, 3D to 2D mapping parts. And I will talk about that today. So let's do text clear mapping, the initial motivation. So maybe this image may sound familiar, may look familiar. Uh, how do I obtain this weird image? I have this 3D model, so uh, and apparently it is consisting of different parts like head and uh, the body that is not visible here, but anyway. So I will map this head to 2D with the algorithm that I will show you today. Uh, and then I will put this 2D image anywhere on this uh, JPEG image file, right? Uh, because basically, I am the creator of this skin texture, base skin texture. So I know that this is a point coming from this 3D point. So, But now, now that I do this base skin texture, then I give it to a technical artist and he paints it up like lips blue for some weird reason and uh, eyes and eyebrows etc and then I can lift it back to 3d to get my uh, texture mapped 3d surface mesh so texture mapping it is not our main topic today but let's recap it from our computer graphics days uh, basically, the task is to associate a UV coordinate system to your texture image where U runs from 0 to 1 and V runs from 0 to 1. Okay. Then, uh, remember, I, I mapped it to this to the UV coordinate frame. So, I will parameterize the surface uh, using only two coordinates. So, in this case, my surface is. Uh, a sphere it is a mathematically defined analytical surface so i can do it mathematically here uh, basically i can represent any point on a sphere using two coordinates two parameters theta and phi what are they so for this point rotate start from here rotate theta amount and then uh, based on your equator rotate another phi amount and you go to this point Okay, basically every x, y, z point can be represented by two parameters uh, using sinus, cosinus as, as an action. Uh, but for arbitrary shape, I don't have that lux, lux theory, so I will show you in the method today. But now that I go to, let's stick with the sphere example, now that I have two parameters phi and theta, uh, I will map them into 0, 1 interval, again, using some analytical uh, calculations. So, I had the UV coordinates now, which run between 0 and 1. What I will do is, I will multiply U with NX. NX is the width of your image, like 800, right? Uh, and ny is like 600, it is the height of the image. Uh, so when you multiply them, uh, I end up with a floating point, a real number. Okay, so it is a sub pixelic projection, so it projects here in my 800 by 600 image. So there is no pixel here because it is a real number. So you can do the nearest neighbor, you can just borrow the intensity of the nearest pixel. It is one method, or you can do bilinear interpolation, like interpolate the four surrounding pixels of this real number sub pixel projection. So, here you do that rounding. This is the right pixel up 
uh, and uh, right top etc so if you do the simple nearest neighbor versus bilinear interpolation so you can see that bilinear seems to be better especially here I notice some artifact in the nearest neighbor case yes, yeah so this is the end of the texture mapping recap uh, but the crucial part still remains a mystery so an arbitrary mesh to 2d so you will see it don't worry we, you, we have seen the parameterization for a mathematically normal yet, but of course it is not sufficient <clears throat> yeah so let's talk about parameterization now uh, if the so we have types like conformal parameterization, equilateral, and isometric. If the angles are preserved uh, after the mm, parameterization, then we have a conformal one, like we see here. Uh, you can see that all angles are 90, and here they are also 90 degrees. Equilateral requests uh, areas to be preserved. It is not equilateral here. Obviously, this purple area. Uh, yeah, got lower, decreased, is decreased. <clears throat> uh, and isometric is length preserving. Uh, all the pairwise lengths between vertex pairs must be preserved, which is again not the case here. Parameterism by activity is also very important. Why this is important? Because think of it that way. Uh, so you have. Uh, two 3D points, okay, this is in the head of the guy, this is in the foot of the guy. If I map them to the same 2D point, which is not bijective, then what happens? So this is the 2D point. I, there is a pink color here. So in my texture mapping, for instance, I get this pink color and put it to the head as well as to the foot, which is not so cool, right? Uh, every vertex needs to access its own unique color so we need to let it let them do it by a bijective parameterization and that is the danger here this 2d so what are the yellow triangles here they are the fold over ones they are like negative area right they uh, fold over to the original triangle. So we see the back side of the triangles. These are the front sides, the white front sides. So instead of this, this is a more preferable to the scenario because there is no yellow, there is no negative area triangle here. Yeah, the same problem happening here. Uh, if my par parameterization of this hand leads to overlaps like foldovers uh, then it is not acceptable because then the same color will be copied to two disjoint points on the 3d original model so let's do some algorithm now. Uh, some algorithms now actually this will be the heart of today's class so this linear system so what is it uh, i have a mesh in 3d or in any dimension, but let's stick with 3D. This is the usual, usual case. I map the boundary of uh, that mesh, boundary vertices, uh, to a convex region in 2D. And I will prefer a disk because it is simple to code the disk parameterization, right? Start with this point, and the next point will be here, the next point will be here. So basically, you do some cosinus sinus multiplications, right? sinus based uh, multiplications and you increase your angle uh, uniformly and you get the disk coordinates so this boundary is okay then the mystery is in the interior points the position of the remaining words are solved by a single sparse linear system as we will see in the following slides this is a linear method then fast school uh, there is also there are also non-linear methods for which I recommend this survey, uh, but I will not go into details of the nonlinear. I will give you the idea of the linear today. So, method one: map with uniform weights. 
So remember, these are the boundary vertices. So first of all, how do I compute them, by the way? Uh, an edge, if it's a regular edge, like an interior non-boundary edge, it is incident to two triangles. That's a fact, so although I draw terribly, let's do, draw it from here. Okay, so this edge is incident to two triangles, and similarly this edge is one, two triangles. Then these are not boundary edges, but this edge, if my boundary is like this, okay, so this is the boundary, this edge is special because it is incident to only one triangle, not the second one. So with that, I can compute the boundary edges, and I can order the vertices on the boundary edges. Uh, so start with this boundary edge. It has two endpoints, and then from this endpoint, go look at the neighbors, go to the next endpoint of the uh, incident border edge, etc. So I will map them to a convex region. So this is convex, okay. It is not disk, but the idea is the same. And then the interior, set the new coordinate of the non-boundary interior as the center of mass of its one ring neighbor. Okay, so that is the idea. Basically, this vertex will be, uh, I don't know what it is, maybe it's here, right? Uh, so it will be in the center of its neighbors in 2D here. So how do I achieve this? So this is a very useful insight here. <clears throat> so if a vertex is in the center of its neighbors, in this case VI has four neighbors, V1, V2, V3, V4, then the following applies, right? A vector from the neighbor to VI, so I draw these vectors, okay? Sum of all these vectors will be zero. That is the idea. Why? Because if it is in the center, then this cancels this and this cancels this, right? Assume that this VI is somewhere here, then this vector will not be able to cancel the opposite one. And also this vector will not be able to cancel this one at all, right? So it is obviously not zero. That is the idea. So this is the key identity that I will use to obtain this non-boundary vertex mapping. So this will be clear in a second once I go through an example. So let's go through this example. This is the input in 3D or 2D, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it looks like to be 2D, but you can also imagine it as 3D. I detect the red boundary vertices, right? They are on the boundary. So I map them to a hexagon. So this is V1, and it is mapped to V1 prime. So I do this manually, actually. I don't do this manually. For hexagon, I may need to do it manually, but for disk, as I mentioned before, given a starting point, you can do cosine, sinus, uh, trigonometry to find the next positions of the following uh, boundary vertices. So this is V2, and it will be bound to V2 prime, etc. And then the blue vertices, the interiors, will be mapped in such a configuration that they will be in the center of their neighbors. So this blue will be in the center of its neighbors. This blue will be in the center of its neighbors. But be careful, when I am setting the cordon of this blue, it will affect the situation of this blue, right? Because it should have been in the center of uh, a vertex set, which includes this one. So it calls for a global optimization so i will put everything into a matrix so it will solve it globally so don't worry about it uh, that's why we will do this linear system so what is happening as i told you v1 goes to v1 prime v2 goes to v2 prime so what are the coordinates this is uh, v1 so this is 1 2 in 2d domain right x1 y2 so bx it's the boundary of the x coordinate v1 and 2 is the boundary of the y coordinate similarly b2 is 2 3 yes b3 is 3 3 b4 is 4 2 right this is 4 uh, 2 uh, b5 is 3 1 and b6 is this one it is 2 1 so these are set 
and the corresponding part of this wonderful matrix called W so it doesn't come from wonderful actually uh, uh, yeah uh, this matrix uh, will be so this will be my system W times X the unknown uh, positions will be equal to B x and by x bx i mean i will first solve it for the x coordinates and then i will do it uh, i will also solve this system the same w matrix unknowns so here the unknowns represents uh, w primes at x coordinates and here the unknowns represent again w prime remember w prime is the mapped position and y coordinates and to make that possible the boundary will be by so from now on I will teach you over bx and the same will be done for by as well so let's stick with the x coordinates here okay so this is w and I will hit this w with the x uh, uh, vector unknowns so this will be not so let's write it technically v1 prime x Oops. so what is this identity part is doing i will take v1 prime x and 0 0 will cancel everyone below i don't care it will be equal to 1 which is wonderful because i want the new position of v1 prime the x position of that to be 1 it is because of this hexagon part here similarly v2 prime x coordinate must be what? it must be 2 uh, it is here so I will put v2 prime uh, x here uh, and again this identity part that is apply, being applied to the boundary will get this identity to me so what is happening we 2 prime x and all others are not considered zero zero dot is equal to two okay so these boundary conditions are written wonderfully now the difficult part is the non-boundary interior vertices so this is what let's focus on v7 okay so this is for the v7 uh, so this will so let's not write it like this but this will hit uh, the this will be used to compute v7 prime x but how will I compute it so I wish I had a pen here to write it from scratch clearly but I, I did it for you in this sheet uh, so let me uh, switch it here so let's talk about v7 prime business okay so remember the identity where is it okay so it is it's here this is the wonderful identity i will go into this so if v7 prime lands to the center of its neighbors so who are my neighbors v1 v2 v3 v8 and v9 so the differences so in this case i is seven okay because i will be talking about v7 i is seven and vjs are the neighbors so v1 v7 minus v1 v7 prime minus v2 prime v7 prime minus v3 prime v7 prime minus v8 prime v7 prime minus v9 prime all this sum if it is set to zero then i know that v7 prime lands to the center of all these guys v1 prime v2 prime etc then i will just multiply everything by minus one for some convenience so these two identities are the same so what just happened here do i have the open version of it so what is happening here let's focus on this equation so how many minus v7 prime i have minus 1 2 
three, four, five. But this five isn't arbitrary. The five here is the number of neighbors, the degree of V sub. Okay, so I have minus five V seven prime x. So it is that minus five actually. This minus five is the seventh. Remember, it will hit the seventh guy. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So all these guys, this guy will hit this guy. And and what else is going on? I add up v one x, v v two prime x, v three prime x. So all the neighbors are added. So if v one prime is the neighbor of v seven prime, which it is, so I will put a one here. V two prime one, v three prime one, because it will hit this v4 prime is not my neighbor let's see because v4 is here v7 is here they are not related at all it is zero okay so that is the idea that is the whole idea actually this part gives the uh, equation for v7 as well so it is more complicated than the boundary cases but i also get it i will also get it for v8 prime and v9 prime which are the other interiors and now that I collect this uh, linear system, we remember w times x is equal to bx. So I solve it. That is it actually. So it is a nice point to congratulate ourselves if we understand this part because it is a very crucial thing in digital geometry processing and it is a nice uh, algorithm. So this system is incredibly fast to solve because it's a sparse matrix why it is sparse because the boundary part here is totally identity and below i have non-zero entries only for the neighbors and the vertex itself and the neighbor of a given point so consider a mesh like this so the neighbor of this point is like in this case like what one two three four five six seven Okay, but uh, but I may have one million other vertices on this domain, right? But the neighborhood is very local. It is like seven, six. So it is very sparse in that row as well, in this row. So it's a sparse matrix. So now let's understand this uh, formally. Now I can show this part here. Remember, I have established this Wx equal to Bx business. So, uh, for the diagonals, if I am in the boundary section, I just put ones. Okay, so it corresponds to these ones. And for the non-boundary part, to the diagonal, I will put minus the sum of the weights. So, assume the weights are one. So, minus ones are added up. How many of them for all the neighbors? Uh, so it will correspond to this minus 5 here it's still in the diagonal be careful uh, and again for the non-boundary part which is in the below part of the W uh, if I and J are neighbors and I put a weight for uniform weight it is just one but we will see better weights actually later uh, and for all the other places I have zero then I will solve this equation for bx and then for by. So I will have x coordinates and y coordinates one by one. So what are the other w's? So far, I talked about uniform weights. Okay, so all the weights were one, which is okay, but not perfect uh, because it doesn't respect the original geometry, original triangulation. Here is one way, the cotangent way is very popular in digital, digital geometry processing. Uh, in this uh, uh, strategy, basically this is happening. For VI, this is my current neighbor VJ, right? Uh, I put a bigger weight to VJ than VK if VJ is closer to me, right? So maybe there are other triangles neighbors of vi okay so uh, remember for vi i need to 
consider all these neighborhood na neighbors VJ VJ1, VJ2, VJ3, VJ4 so VJ1 is closer to me to VI than VJ4 so it should have a bigger effect and this cotangent captures that uh, basically the intuition of this is uh, it is the distance sum of these distances over this edge length so if this edge length is small then this weight is large right something like that so uh, but the problem is with cotangent weights if we have obtuse angles like big angles the ones more than 90 degrees then they may be negative and uh, negative weights will lead to non bijectivity which is not desired so as a remedy they provide this tangent based uh, harmonic mapping uh, it is never negative so it is uh, uh, it is uh, it leads to bijective uh, parameterizations and by the way uh, did you notice these angles so for when I was computing WIJ I focus on the opposite angles of this edge and for the tangent again for this edge I focus on the uh, neighbor angles and I inject them to the tangent function yeah, so in the end, we have the same system, Wx, uh, Bx, uh, and, uh, and Wy, sorry, and so Wx for x coordinates, Bx, and then Wx, so this x is for unknown, and this y is for y coordinates, is equal to By. So this is the same for all these three methods but the weighting these weights actually these are uniform here but it can be non-uniform as well so here we don't see yeah, yeah we see a difference so the grid pattern that i pulled back from 2d is not that cool in the uniform case uh, so here is another mesh which is in this topology by the way how do I see it you don't see it but the below of this bottom of this bunny is remote so it is this topology so these vertices go to the disk and similarly for the head there is nothing behind it so uh, and anyway so uniform in the uniform case every vertex is literally in the center of its neighbors so this may not respect original geometry here but in the harmonic case they are not necessarily in the center so I, I i see this guy for instance it is not right in the center right it is a little bit deviated which is okay because in the original one it is like that yeah so as i uh, told you uh, texture mapping is one way to uh, do this uh, to utilize this uh, to the parameterization and disk parameterization the boundary is a disk get the image and pull it back <clears throat> also let me open some light because it is getting dark uh, yeah so what is happening uh, so in general it's a good idea to improve the mesh quality before uh, uh, before applying a parameterization method because as we have seen obtuse angles are problematic although we fixed it with uh, the tangent based uh, mean value parameterization but still it is always a good idea to start with a better shape so this is a fixed boundary parameterization F fixed meaning that uh, the boundary is uh, going to be fixed to a disk or another uh, uh, convex region but uh, there is a problem when the uh, boundary in the original domain is not similar to a convex shape uh, or then I am kind of forcing it and this forcing will lead to uh, distortions in the end so to solution is don't 
use the entire mesh at once instead uh, segment it into triangular patches okay so like run the extra shortest path from here to one vertex it gives me this geodesic path another geodesic path and another so i have this triangle-ish region and this patch it is in 3d it can be mapped to 2d with a triangle boundary which is okay because it's very similar to this thing right although i didn't draw it in the same direction but you will uh, map it like this so this is one idea free boundary on the other end is the idea of competing boundary of the 2d domain as part of the solution so it is a more principled solution actually but then i will lose this linearity uh, so it won't be that fast it won't be that simple uh, but it will be it is expected to be more accurate actually uh, so i can mimic free boundary parameterization with some uh, with some tactic here uh, basically what is this this paper i found recently was about virtual boundaries so the idea is cool uh, not the best idea ever but it's okay it's a good idea so this is the boundary of the face right if i fix it to a disk as we have done before and i let the other interiors find its uh, way the airway then the, there will be distortions the eyes are not that good right so the solution is put a virtual boundary around it and map this virtual boundary so fix that virtual one to a disk and also add a layer of maybe one or two layers of triangles between this virtual and the actual boundary then what happens is this actual boundary becomes interior in this case so it is kind of free in this domain and that is the idea so uh, i don't care what happens to the layer of gray triangles here but the actual boundary is uh, uh, treated as a interior part which makes them uh, travel better in the 2d domain yeah so uh what is happening uh, mds i talk about mds here multi-dimensional scaling uh, uh, so let's read it carefully all methods so far were angle preserving uh, conformal uh, except the method one because in that one we minimized uh, nothing in particular uh, we just move the vertex to the center of its neighbors right uh, so in mds based method uh, it minimizes distance distortion so what is that distance between two 3d points and their 2d map points are kept as close as possible so this is also a free boundary method because the boundary vertices are not treated differently every vertex will be treated the same and will be treated by 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 this so let me first show you the uh, idea here so it is the idea uh, the uh, distance of these two vertices i and j in the original domain so g is like uh, the geodesic distance here i guess but uh, it will be any distance uh, the dissimilarity between i and j i want it to be as close as possible to the euclidean distance between the uh, salt points uh, the, the points that i am looking for v right so i am minimizing for v that is the idea so what is happening in this case for instance if the distances i am talking about is the geodesic distance so from this hand to this head it is 67 right like this so what it uh, implies is the Euclidean distance of the corresponding image points this point and this point will also be 67 similarly from belly to knee it is 20 then belly to knee it will be a 20 Euclidean distance 
right? So this is the idea. So you parameterize this 3D set into again 3D in this case, but with uh, with reasonable distances. So why are they reasonable? Because of this cool uh, feature actually. No matter what my pose is in this case, uh, it will still be 67, right? Because it is a distance over the surface. So this image point versus the head point, sorry, it will still be 67. Okay, just like this. So in the end, I end up with the same embedding, same parameterization for two different lipose shapes, and then I can use it to uh, find the correspondence between them. But for the texture mapping case, uh, again, so this is the idea, right? Uh, so 3D distances are mapped uh, as Euclidean distances in this MDS uh, parameterization domain. You can parameterize to anywhere. So in this case, I parameterize to R3, from R3 to R3. Here, I do it from R3 to R2 which is okay, which is good for text clear mapping. And here I also do from R3 to R3. So you see I have the same pattern. Don't worry about the rigid uh, differences. The important part is the non-rigid differences are gone. Uh, and so this is the high resolution version. It is called Landmark MDS. Actually, it is again finding this MDS embedding is computationally expensive so they do it only for the landmarks and then they map the others based on their distances to the computed landmark points so it is just a detail I am skipping it yeah so this MDS business actually landmark MDS in particular is used explicitly in this parameterization paper that's why I talked about it actually uh, so uh, they separate this entire shape into regions and then they parameterize it using MDS to 2D and then they uh, yeah so they have the uh, bodies in 2D different segments they call them charts uh, there is another issue parameterization refinement uh, so assume that you didn't pay much attention to your parameterization algorithm, so you ended up with foldovers like negative area triangles, like overlaps, which I don't want. There are methods that work as a post processing method, and they can fix this issue. Basically, I can convert this to this shape that involves no negative area 2D triangles, and then you can further do some uh, smoothing or some vertex relocation to go from here to here but the critical part is this part actually so how does this happen so remember i don't want negative array triangles so i minimize function a function so let's think about this function alpha i is the area of the i triangle uh, <clears throat> in 2d i have negative array triangles in 3d i have negative volume tetrahedron then this will be the volume of the I tetrahedron. But let, let's skip, uh, stick to the, to the case. So uh, the area of a triangle, if it is minus 7, what is happening here? It becomes 7, 7 minus minus 7, 14. So it is a high cost, right? Not 0. So I don't allow negative 7 or negative numbers. So I minimize this effects, right? It is good, it's a smart idea, but there is a problem. It also allows zero area triangles, which are degenerate, because zero minus zero is zero. I, I allow it, I, I like it actually, but uh, this function likes it, but I don't like it, because zero area triangle is something like this. Okay, it is not even drawable. Uh, so it is degenerate. Uh, so to avoid that they do this beta, uh, beta is the minimum uh, is used to prevent zero array case. Like uh, if you keep it two, then there won't be any array less than two. Uh, 
and this is the squared version of this function. I do it because the squared version enables differentiation and hence better gradient descent uh, for this guy, etc. Yeah, so this is, uh, and if you don't like derivatives at all, you can feed this function to a library like Ceres from Google, uh, which is the one I am familiar with. Uh, also, others exist. Uh, so. You can also minimize a function like this. using MATLAB also has some uh, functionality for that, I guess. So let me go to another related topic. So far, I parameterized meshes in 3D to 2D, like to disk, okay? But those meshes are assumed to be in this topology. So I had, uh, 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 okay, so I had this guy, it's in 3D, but it is in this topology because there is no back of it. So I can just map this boundary to disk. Similarly, there is no bottom of this bunny. So I can map that part to disk. But what if my mesh is totally closed? Then you need to do a cutting. It is called cut or seam, same business. So you select a cut, it is also a problem, research problem, assume you select a good one and then you duplicate the vertices along this cut meaning what? meaning that I obtain this configuration so if I have V7, V10, V34 here then V7, V10, V34 will be here and here they are duplicates like V7 prime, V10 prime, etc. so it will be even clear in this visualization this is the cut or seam, what I do it is I duplicate this vertex uh, and then I have this this topology basically I, it is not watertight anymore if I put water in it, it will leak right from here, so it is in other words in this topology and then I can safely apply my uh, disk parameterization algorithm like the ones I discussed in the beginning of this class uh, so what is the, where should I put the cuts? Uh, so this paper is very easy to understand, and it is also using minimum spanning trees like a, a cool tool in computer science. Uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> you may want to intuitively you want to put this cut into regions that tolerate uh, distortions. Uh, because of what? Because of the following. So, if this is the cut, when you map it to 2D, okay, what happens? So, this part comes here and this part will come here. So, for instance, we are doing texture mapping. Although these two points are very close in reality, but the image points are very different, so they may borrow. Uh, different colors uh, which causes discontinuities on the original 3D domain when you pull them back <clears throat> so that's the problem uh, uh, yeah so what is happening here Hem, and by the way a single cut may not be sufficient in most of the cases uh, we may be using many cuts okay so like we discussed and recently there is this trend. So, so far the, the cut is like a preprocessing. You first find the cuts and then you uh, do the parameterization disjointly. Recently they try to do it jointly, finding the cut or seam and the parameterization at the same time. So these are all new algorithms that lead to nicer results. And uh, I used many of the 2D uh, parameterization <clears throat> figures from these videos actually and there are more there I recommend you to watch them uh, if you don't understand what I said today or if you want more details etc <clears throat> now let's do another parameterization so far we dealt with 3D to, to 2D and it was good for texture mapping but if you think about this mesh or any other mesh, not any other, but most of the other meshes, the more natural representation is 3D. 
for a closed manifold cleanest zero meshes like this mesh is closed it is uh, watertight it is in sphere topology so why do I not use a sphere domain as my target domain here it's a good idea genus 1 basically genus counts the number of handles right there is no handle here it is 0 there is one handle here so it's genus 1 and I can map it to a torus but not to a sphere so this is uh, hopefully not misleading you this is the one that motivates me to do spherical parameterization uh, yeah so we discussed the discontinuity issue for the cut base method and in sphere there will be no cuts uh, is the best range since all such meshes are topologically equivalent or homomorphic to a sphere no cutting or gluing is needed which is nice and uh, I talked about this a little bit in the beginning uh, correspondence of different shapes can be obtained if I go to a spherical domain and then once I have them I can make interpolation morphing also brain, brain imaging guys like it a lot because for instance they want to compare this brain of one patient to another brain so in 2D didactic example is like these two weird domains if I map them both to a circle, something I know, and uh, I basically map them to each other, and then I can find their differences easily. Or even without a second shape, I can see a problem, a feature more clearly if I uh, <clears throat> expand it to a sphere, like get rid of all these uh, penetrations, etc. So I will show you a couple of methods. Uh, towards spherical parameterization first one reduces the problem to planar case what is happening here cut one triangle out so it will be my boundary then okay uh, so I have a sphere it is fully closed right if I cut one triangle here out it is not here anymore so there is a leak basically I have this topology here so this part this triangle will be mapped to a very big convex triangle, obviously convex in 2D, and all others will be mapping inside of it in such a way that one vertex is in the center of its neighbors, etc. So we have seen this mapping. So parameterized open mesh to unit triangle, triangle as we have seen here, any parameterization will do, like the uh, cotangent weight one, etc. Uh, then I have this uh, shape in 2D. Uh, there is something called stereo projection, which is the example of it is here. Uh, from the North Pole of this sphere, if I do it, I end up with this 2D. So you will do the inverse of it to get from plane to the sphere. So it's the results uh, spherical parameters of the bunny is this not that impressive but it is at least sphere uh, another method is also cut based uh, like i go to a planar domain first how do i do it i cut the mesh into two pieces uh, and each one is a disk now uh, then i can parameterize them as before and then I map each this parameterization to half sphere, hemisphere, by adding the proper Z component. Now I have two half spheres and I have this common cut and I put it to the equator and I glue the spheres. So the boundary in this case will presumably contain more than just three vertices. Remember in this case in the boundary I have one to three vertices so it is not that flexible so each of the two parameters will be less distorted now because I have a uh, better <coughs> I have more vertices in the boundary so I can be more flexible so this is preferable over method one but 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 result strongly depends on the specific cut use so remember i was i don't like this cut business anyway a lot so i am doing the cutting here so what is the purpose the per, uh, 
Now I, it defeats the purpose. The purpose was uh, do this spherical parameterization cut free. And here is a method that I finally like. Uh, so it has a nice idea for a convex shape or a star shaped object. What is a star shaped object? Obvious, this is a star shaped object, by the way, but not a real star, I mean. It is an object where I have an interior point such that it sees all other boundary points. And seeing seeing means what? Seeing means there is a line from there to other points. So this is not convex, right? But it is uh, star shaped because here is the interior point. From here I can see all the boundary uh, vertices, right? And seeing means I draw a line, draw a line, and this line is completely inside the polygon or inside the polyhedron in 3D and it doesn't intersect any other edges it just hits the boundary vertex actually this is not a good location because this doesn't see this point so my bad but uh, I think if I put the interior point here right it sees everyone here yeah so it's, it seems to be okay then let's go to this figure the idea is uh, now that I see this uh, every vertex from this cool interior point. I select it, and this interior point is moved to the origin. Okay, then I send the ray from that point to all the vertices, and I pull this vertex out or in uh, until this ray has a length of one. So what is happening? This vertex is pushed like this. This vertex is pushed like this. This vertex is pushed like this, etc. This is pushed to here. So every point here will have one distance. Meaning what? Meaning that I have a sphere in the end. Although it's a terrible drawing. But in this case, what is going to happen? This vertex will be pulled back, not pulled out. This is a nice idea. Uh, send a ray from P to each vertex. This ray moves the hit vertex in or out until it has unit length. And this interesting interior point is found uh, using computational geometry. Basically, uh, you take the half spaces of all the triangles inside the shape and you intersect them. If it's a star shaped, uh, object then that intersection is a convex region and any point inside that convex region works for your uh, interior point that sees everyone else uh, so this is for this method is for convex by the way convex shape is obviously star shaped right oh, sorry it is not convex so let's do it like this obviously any point will do select this point it sees any other point so it is star shaped by default but for any object not just convexes and stars it is difficult to solve this problem there are some heuristics uh, that i will just give one of them how how can we live with this configuration send rays from the object center to each vertex okay just like we do it pull down to unisphere just like method 3 now if object is not star shaped then there will be overlaps why because when I uh, pull so the ray so the ray is like this it hits this vertex and as well as this vertex so this is vertex, uh, I don't know, vertex 7, and this is vertex 92. They are totally irrelevant. These are different parts of the objects, so like maybe it is the... Uh, what am I drawing? I don't know, but uh, so yeah, this is... Uh, so the point is, this ray... Uh, it pulls it so it is not length one now uh, now it will be length one okay at this point so what just happened this is the sphere point and in the end i will 
draw a sphere like this, right? So what happened? V7 as well as V92, they both map to the same point. So there will be overlaps, just like we see here. So this can be fixed like this, not a, a guaranteed solution, but pull V7 to the center of its neighbors. So it will change the location of V7. It will not be on the sphere anymore and then project it back to sphere. So why does this have a potential to work? Because the neighbors of V7 are totally different than the neighbors of V92. Okay, so in other words, when I pull V7 to the center of its neighbor, it will go to a different place than V92 does. So it is likely to prevent their collision. But again, this is not a perfect solution. So parameterization is over. Uh, let's finish the class with uh, sphere generation. So what is the point here actually? Because I did spherical parameterization, I went to a sphere from a 3D shape. I made the sphere. So I, I just think that it is related to be able to create a sphere from scratch, not by parameterizing one existing shape to a sphere. Okay, so it is not about parameterization. How to generate a sphere from scratch? One method is go from polar to Cartesian coordinates. What is that? Uh, uh, again, x, y, z, they are known by uh, the polar, they can be obtained by the polar coordinates theta and phi. Uh, so by just increasing theta and phi with small angles, I can get the corresponding points and then I can create uh, squats, uh, quads from them so this is one way but actually the other way that I like better is about is more about polygon mesh processing our class it is about remeshing start with a tetrahedron like the basic shape split each face to four because tetrahedron is a star shaped right star sh shape it means that there is an interior point like the center it sees every other point so i can populate the vertices by bisecting the edges from the middle and then i do the ray action send a ray from the center and pull the heat vertex towards uh, the sphere boundary where the length of this ray is one then you redo the recursion uh, subdivision and do the do it again again and again so the thing is at any time you will have a star shaped uh, star shaped star shape and so this cool method 3 may apply uh, yeah so if you start with a cube obviously you will not have this subdivision because it's a cube you will have what is the subdivision here take one face which is a square or rectangle, it doesn't matter. You create four new uh, faces out of it, like with this tactic. So this face becomes this thing here, I guess. Starting with uh, <clears throat> Icosahedron seems to do a better job than Tetrahedron start because uh, the cone points here are the triangles tend to be smaller towards there so this start leads to a better uh, mesh in terms of uniformity and uh, yeah that wraps it up rips it up actually so as usual i give you some potential project topic alerts uh, back then and with that i will stop thanks